So for episode 13, I'm going to be taking you through my full process for editing a render. So we're kind of at the end of the series for a interior render. And I have made quite a few changes since the last episode. And I've actually spent a few hours now just tweaking little things that um, just kind of bring everything together. And instead of like recording that real time it kind of takes ages to do that i just thought i'd give you guys a quick update on the changes i made and um yeah we where we're at now so just before we jump into photoshop i actually added a few additional elements into the scene so i added this um creeper that runs all along the top of the brick wall and that's from 3d shaker there's a link in the description for that and also a um, kind of ivy that's kind of growing up the brick wall and that's also from 3d shaker link in the description um, a few other little tweaks i added was i added a rug in in the scene and this little side table desk thingy, um, little coffee table. And I also just added a hanging light here. So those are kind of the main ones um, in terms of furniture. And then I just added this tree um, in the center here, which just adds a little bit more visual interest. Um, and the only other small tweak that I made is I've lifted all the plywood up about 10 millimeters which is one centimeter um, and that just allows you to see a little nice negative detail um, which just adds that little little bit of dimensionality there so what you basically do what I do is once you've once you've um, you know gone into your render settings um, under sampling I normally just go 2000 samples if it's an if it's a day scene and I'll just use, um, you know, open image denoise. I've rendered with my CPU just because my GPU, it, it is a good one. I think it's a 3070, um, but it's only eight gigabytes and I've got 56 gigabytes. Oh, I've got 64 gigabytes of normal RAM. So, and because the scene is so big, I, you know, needed to use my CPU. Um, it's not a great CPU. It took me about two hours to render this but um, for a final render, it's worth it. My um, actual um, resolution is 1080 by 1350, and that's a four by five ratio, which is perfect for Instagram. Okay, so basically what you do is, you know, the little render view comes up. This is what it looks like here. Um, and once it finishes rendering, this will be looking pretty good. So you can see I've got just a heap of layering with the hit, um, the climbers and the ivy and the and this tree in here. It just kind of adds a lot, and also you can see that negative detail just just kind of adds a little bit more realism. And that rug there just adds a bit of layering along with the lamp, uh, the lamp, the um, pendant lamp. So that's pretty much how the raw render looks. And now what I do is I go up to image, save as, and I will save it as a TIFF. So I basically go down here and I'll go TIFF, and we're going to do a 16-bit color depth. And that's basically all I do in terms of formatting. So I pretty much just drag and drop or open up this TIFF render in Photoshop. And then I don't actually do any editing in Photoshop in the standard kind of view, what I do is I go up to filter, convert to, f to smart filters, and then I'll go up here and I'll go camera raw filter. So camera raw filter is quite similar to Lightroom in the sense that you have all these different options down here. And it, I just feel like it's a little, little bit more user friendly than, um, you know, than using Photoshop with all the layers and everything. So what I'm going to do first is um, I've set up a color filter in my um, windows. So um, control windows C turns it to black and white. If you go into your settings uh, search bar and you type in color filters, you can turn that on. 
So basically what I do is I turn my whole screen to black and white and that will help me see the value range and how the blacks and the whites are kind of looking in the overall scene. So what I do up here is I basically look at this histogram to start with and you can see the bottom of this curve. This basically illustrates where the overall light is and the brightness and darkness in the scene. So you can see this bell-shaped curve here is actually really low. So to start out with, I'm just going to make a small adjustment to the exposure just to kind of lift that up and push that up a little bit, but not too much. I still like how low it is. And you can see that kind of makes a big difference in terms of being able to see things easier. I don't want it to be like right in the middle because you can see that kind of blows everything out. So instead of doing that, you know, just lifting the exposure up and getting that nice and perfect, I'm going to do that with the um, shadows and a few other tabs. So I'm just going to play around with the shadows slider now. I'm going to lift it up a little bit. And then the highlights, I might keep relatively as they are. And then the contrast, let's just tweak that a little bit. I really like using this camera or filter just because it's just so easy and user friendly to play around with all the lighting and everything. So that's looking pretty good. The blacks, I normally like to keep where they are. The whites, um, yeah. The whites I like to push up a little bit because it just kind of... Um, boosts boosts all the whites quite nicely and you can see even though we kept the exposure where it was and we played around with the other sliders this exposure bell curve is now getting a little bit higher so the next stage is I'm going to actually go out of the um, black and white mode with control window C and you can see that it is pretty pretty saturated and bright and my personal um, taste is I like it a little bit desaturated. So you notice when we boost the, sh the, sh the shadows and the lights and we kind of really like bring the exposure up, that also impacts the colors because everything's kind of tied in and it can get complicated, but it doesn't need to be. So basically... I always start off with the values in black and white and then I'll do the colors once the actual value range is looking good. In terms of colors, I will just boost the vibrance up and I will lower the saturation. And that's just quite a nice way to play with the colors so that it's not too it's not too saturated but the vibrance is still there. Um, and then down here there's like a curve adjustment. So I normally click on this um, parametric curve um, to, where is it, is it here, um, hmm. oh yeah, okay, so I basically come across here to the point curve, and then I'm just going to boost the black levels up, and I'm going to lower that back down, and I'm just playing around with adding these little points here, and the further up this line you go, the more you impact either the highlights or the shadows. So right up here, this is your white level. And I don't want to make this tutorial, tutorial too complicated. So you can completely skip this step if you want. And you can just basically um, just do everything in here. And that's actually probably what I'll do. But I just thought I'd show you what that looks like. Cool. So moving forwards in the detail panel, I like to add a lot of sharpness. Um, and I find it just really adds a lot. If you hold Alt, you can see in black and white easier um, how, how much your sharpness is impacting the scene. As soon as you take it to black and white, you can see immediately like where it's too far. If I go to the orange panel, we're just going to go down to the color mixer essentially, and we're going to just edit the colors a little bit. 
So the main colors in here is like this orangey yellow color and we've got this green color back here and I actually think this works quite well because you've got two colors that are primary colors almost and there's no other huge colors in the scene, no, no other dominant colors in the scene. So already this composition is reading quite well. So if I go to the saturation, I'm just going to play around a little bit with this plywood saturation. I don't want it to be too saturated. And the yellows as well. Let's just see. I normally just play with a slider and see, see how everything gets impacted. And then the greens are the other real important part of this scene. So I'm actually going to leave the greens relatively where they are. And what I do, if, if I want to see if a color is actually even in the scene, I'll just boost the saturation to 100 and then I'll lower it. And that kind of allows me to see if I'm actually doing anything with it. So with a render, depending on the color grading you're going for, you might want just one primary color, which is a analogous color palette. Or you might want another one, which is like a complementary um, color palette, which is kind of similar to what we're going with here. So once you've kind of played around with the saturation, normally with the purples and magentas, I like to take these mostly out because they're not very natural colors that you would see in nature. And the blue as well, like there is a little bit of blue you can see when I boost that up, but we actually don't really want the blue in this scene. So we're going to lower that right down. And then the aquas, there's not really much there. So in the luminance, I'm going to play around with, luminance basically is the, the lighting, how do I explain this, the light and darkness of each color. So you can see if I do the orange, it like actually adds almost light into the orange, but you want to be really careful with luminance because it can look very unnatural very quickly. So I almost will just keep the luminance where it is because it's actually working quite well. Um, yeah, I actually think almost that blue can come up because you can see when I do the blue, it actually adds quite a nice highlight there. Um, so I might boost that up a little bit. And then the purple as well. Cool. So if we come back to the hue panel, which is the first one, the orange, you can see we can kind of tweak the hue of the orange to be either or. And I actually don't think that looks very good. So I'm going to keep the orange where it is. Let's just play around with the reds. So there's not much red in the scene. Um, and then the blues. I think the blues are right. So I think generally the colors in here are looking quite good out from the get-go, which is great. Um, if we go down to optics... Um, actually, let's skip optics. Let's do geometry. I normally just do a auto correction. Um, not sure if that looks better. Huh? Maybe my scene wasn't actually. Um, maybe it wasn't level to begin with. I think that's actually better. That's good. Level. Okay, cool. Down here in the effects panel, I like to add a little bit of grain back into the render. Um, and you'll be like, what? Why on earth would you want to add grain? I find that it just adds a little bit of realism and, and detail into it. So you want to avoid grain when you're rendering something. But when you're actually doing a bit of color editing and you're doing post-production, I like to add the grain back in and more of a uniform film kind of effect. And in the vignette, you can kind of add a little subtle one, not too intense, you know, just like, just a little bit, depending on your, your taste and your style of editing. So I think that's generally looking quite good. Um, what I might do is I might just go back in black and white mode, and I'll just have another player, quick play around with the lighting. Um, after we've edited the colors, the lighting can get impacted, so there is a little bit of back and forth that happens and you can see this exposure histogram up here is looking quite good um, 
yeah, I think that's quite good. So if you go OK, that's pretty much it. So if we go between <laughs> what was the, the actual render and afterwards, you can see it's a huge change. And of course, this is just my personal taste. You know, you can edit things in a completely different way, whatever your vision is. Um, but that's that's pretty much it. The only other thing that I do is I will duplicate this and I will merge, I'll basically flatten, oh, wrong one. I will race rasterize this and then I'll go the one that I duplicated and I'll go up to filter, other, high pass and I'll just do like 1.5 or something like that and then we'll change this to overlay. And you can see that's way too much. But what I do is I drop that down and slowly bring it back in. And that just adds another level of crunch to the scene. You may like it, you may not. Um, it's just a personal taste. So this is the end of my Blender interior course for beginners. I hope you found this useful. Um, if you have been following along and doing your own renders, I would love to see them. If you want to post them on my Discord, there's a link in the description and you can kind of get feedback from me and see how you can improve a little bit further. And you can also check out my Instagram at Oliver Higgins Architecture and you can see the kind of work I do as a professional. So I hope you found this useful. Stay tuned for the next series. If you haven't subscribed already, make sure to subscribe because I don't want you to miss anything. So I'll see you guys next time. Cheers.